Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So uh, good, uh, good uh, morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to uh, kind of a continuation of uh, a derivative of our speaker series that we offer in Microsoft Research. Um, I um, had some time this morning to spend with uh, David Pensack, who uh, has done an amazing thing uh, with creating uh, three actual startup businesses. Uh, and so some people think, you know, some people come into our speaker series and they talk about innovation, they talk about invention. They talk about what should be done. Well, what's interesting about David, and the reason I brought him here today, is because he's not only he not only talks about it, but he actually has done it. He's done three startups. He's worked for DuPont as their chief scientist. He's a ton of experience in com in computer science on the security side, but also on the infrastructure side. So it relates to kind of what we all do on a day to day basis uh, for Microsoft. So I thought I'd bring him here and talk about innovation, talk about some of the principles that he has learned, done it in a very simple way. He'll even talk about how he's used some things from uh, childhood teaching and what he's learned from children in terms of the principles of innovation. I think you'll find it interesting. And I'm hoping that all of you that are out there on ResNet are, enjoy this talk as well. So with that, David Pensack, and uh, we'll have a bunch of Q&A and, and other things afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to finally make it to Redmond <clears throat> after sending all my <clears throat> hard-earned dollars for all the boxes of software I bought. It's nice to, to meet some, some of you folks. Phil gave me a very interesting challenge because <clears throat> I spent 30 years at DuPont and then I joined the faculty at Wharton Business School <clears throat> where I teach a course that I developed entitled Innovation, the Processes of Innovation and Invention. And Phil said, I'd like you to take the full year's course, which is 28 three-hour sessions plus homework, and I'd like you to condense it down into one hour. He said, Microsoft people are absolutely brilliant, and they can pick up everything you're going to say in a heartbeat, and don't worry about giving them homework assignments either because they don't need them. They listen. So the first issue we had was, what am I going to actually call the talk? Because any time you hear senior corporate management talk, they say, well, and we're going to make a big push in innovation this year. And now let's move on to something else like safety or budget, whatever. If you ever raise your hand and say, well, what do you mean by innovation and how are you going to do it? It's, oh, that's, let's take that one offline. <clears throat> so they want innovation, <clears throat> but then again, they really don't. <clears throat> because people who are innovative are a pain in the ass. Let's be charitable. One. They don't fit in the normal mold. <clears throat> They require more and different management. They've got different uh, sets of gratification schedules and the whole bit. And then actually taking their ideas, God forbid, that might turn out to be useful for something, well, that takes money and devotes people away who are otherwise occupied from the business. So what they really want is the results of innovation, but they don't want to be innovative. So I'm, what I'm going to try to talk to you about today is <clears throat> the, the second choice for a title, which was the business of innovation. Because innovation, if it doesn't impact your bottom line, is absolutely worthless. We should all be running adult daycare centers if that's all we want to do. <clears throat> and at DuPont, we discovered over the years <clears throat> that what was wrong with our culture was we had a very low toxicity and a very high viscosity to ideas. Ideas could hang around for years and years and years and progress just a little bit each year, but we never killed them off. <clears throat> So the last couple of years I was there, we worked on increasing the toxicity and decreasing the viscosity. So ideas and opportunities would move along much more quickly, but a lot of them would die. We have people who work on the same project for 25 years. Being a 200-year-old company, we could get away with that. <clears throat> uh, but the real title of the, of the talk, <clears throat> those of you who know me, I'm addicted to raising dogs. So I have six Bichon Frises at home. And one day I was sound asleep on the couch, and all the dogs climbed up on top of me, and they went to sleep as well. And my nine-year-old son took a photograph of all this, and he said, Daddy, you should entitle the talk, <clears throat> Innovation for Underdogs. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> I'm in the process of <clears throat> writing a book about all this, and realistically, that's what we're going to call it, <clears throat> Innovation for Underdogs. <clears throat> and the sequel to it, we're interviewing senior executives from a number of companies in the area. 
and then applying my methodologies to that. <clears throat> and that book, this will be a chapter for each of the, the different companies, and it's going to be entitled The Underdogs Meet the Overlords. <clears throat> Needless to say, the publisher hasn't agreed to that one yet. <clears throat> but there's, there's a cultural reason why innovation is hard. <clears throat> How many of you remember the old Watergate hearings when Sam Irvin <clears throat> was on the Senate? Watergate committee. <clears throat> he was a crusty old guy and he would say, well, I'm just an old country boy, can you make this simple for me? <clears throat> but he reminded you very much of an alligator that was lying there in the swamp, not moving, and you come along all of a sudden, snap, he's got you. So we built a very simple two by two world model in which innovation lives. The X axis has two states, conscious and unconscious, and the Y axis has two states, competent and incompetent. So the four states are you know you know, you know you don't know, you don't know you know, and you don't know you don't know. <clears throat> Corporate America is really good in the know you know quadrant. That's their comfort zone. They love to stay there. And they keep thinking, we can grow our business bigger and bigger and bigger by staying in that quadrant. Well, they can't. So the trend these days is going to the, the know you don't know quadrant. You look at your competition and say, hey, we can play catch up. We're smarter than they are. We have more dollars than they do, unless, of course, they're Google. <clears throat> and that doesn't work either because they've got their longstanding traditions and all their momentum. And then the one that's even more scary, and I know you folks have it just like we did at DuPont, <clears throat> is the don't know you know. As somebody moves to a new assignment or retires, the last thing they do is they take everything in their filing cabinets and their bookcases and they toss it in the trash with neither knowledge nor care of, is that the only copy of the information? It got so bad at DuPont that a recent study showed that 45% of all the analytical chemistry tests that were done in the division were just repeats of ones that had already been done they couldn't find the results of. Now when you're resource limited, that gets to be a little bit on the, the painful side. <clears throat> and where some of this sp spun from, <clears throat> there was a wonderful paper that came out in 1959 by McCulloch and Pitts entitled, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain. It was an attempt to understand at the neurophysiological level why birds do not attack, <clears throat> sorry, why well, frogs do not attack birds and rocks. Now, you would like to assume that the average corporate executive has an intellect slightly greater than a frog. But if you look at some of the decisions that get made, you sometimes begin to wonder. Well, what they found was in the back of the frog's eye are very specialized receptors. So if the object in the field of view was not this moving at the speed of food, like a fly, or the size of a fly, the frog never saw it at all. Its whole visual system was nothing but flat gray and things that were edible. So the frog couldn't help himself. He didn't trigger anything any kind of movement except when he saw something that over millions of years had evolved to be edible in his mind. So look at corporate executives. They've gotten where they are by learning over the years what's worked and what does not, but the world is changing at an unbelievable pace right now. So everything they learned is wrong. Now that's an unpopular thing to say, but there was a study that was done at MIT where a molecular biologist took some very young frogs, and he severed the optic nerve, <clears throat> removed the eyes, rotated them 180 degrees, put them back in, and sewed the nerve together. After about six weeks, <clears throat> the frogs became completely functional again. The cerebral cortex reprogrammed itself, and the nerve regenerated, and everything was great in the world of frogs. But then he did the same experiment with what I indelicately referred to as senior executive frogs, and what he found was that while the nerve regenerates, the cerebral cortex does not reprogram. So the frog's brain processing of the visual image was 180 degrees out of phase. So if you put food here, the frog jumped that way. So the argument that we made was if you have an important, fast-moving project, take somebody who's very senior and experienced, put them in charge, and do exactly the reverse of everything they say. Well, after finishing that presentation, one of our EVPs slammed his fist down on the table and said, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Get out of here. So I smiled and said, okay, that's one vote for it. <clears throat> <laughs> so part of what you have to deal with in any corporate environment is dealing with people who've gotten where they have gotten by doing what they did very well. And I do not mean to be disrespectful of them. They've all gotten us so 
we can afford to retire and do nice things like that. But the world is changing at a staggering rate. Now, I'm somewhat prejudiced because my father was one of the early designers of television for RCA. So we had TVs before I was born. I was nine years old before I saw radio for the first time. And all I could say was, Daddy, where's the picture? My son, who's now nine, has had an iMac since he was 18 months old. A world without the internet, without a computer, is alien to him. What will his kids be like? We have to learn as adults and the leaders of our companies to be a lot more flexible and recognize that the world is changing. Because there's the old line, never accept no for an answer except when someone has the authority to say yes. But I, Phil told me he's going to have a special on Kevlar vests, for those of you who follow that. Okay, my screen has just gone dark. Okay. <clears throat> so first I want to talk about what really is innovation. <clears throat> because innovation and invention are often lumped together, but they're two radically different things. Innovation is nothing more <clears throat> than trying to find a solution to a well-defined problem from what's already known out there. Uh, <clears throat> there's the old line, something old, something new. I'll, I'll give you, for instance, <clears throat> I'm working on a project right now with one of the children's hospitals in, in Delaware where we're using electroencephalography to try to understand when children with learning disabilities can actually comprehend. Because most of them with severe learning disabilities have a major communications deficit as well. Some are totally aphasic. <clears throat> and we started looking at the EEG traces and we realized there's no way you're going to be able to actually understand brain function given the coarse resolution of that. But the squiggles looked an awful lot like seismic traces. <clears throat> so we did a little search and we found some great software from the Colorado School of Mines for early earthquake prediction by looking at small changes in the, in the signals <clears throat> and used that to solve the problem of understanding the EEGs. For the fun of it, we went back to the American Psychological Association. We said, can you survey your members? Does anybody out there have a degree in clinical psychology and formal training in theoretical geophysics. No big surprise, none of them did. So it's not surprising that nobody had come up with you know, the one from column A and one from column B. So innovation is nothing more than building a broad model of what's out there. So once you've got a decent description of what you want to do, and we'll get into some of those in a little bit, it's just go find it because somebody else has probably already done it. Now, invent, invent, sorry, invention is radically different. Mother Nature is wonderful at keeping secrets. And there's all kinds of things out there that uh, we just haven't been smart enough to figure out yet. And part of what's necessary for invention is what Kohler's called a willing suspension of disbelief. We're trying to get as a consultant to the Innovation Institute, which I'm setting up, some of the guys from Hollywood who do... Star Trek and Star Wars and the like. Because if you think about it, they are the absolute masters at taking technology which doesn't even exist yet and finding a way to visually represent it and communicate it to the man in the streets so they'll understand the value proposition. I mean, how many of you would like to have a transporter? Isn't that really part of our culture? We're often talking about that and food replicator. Star Trek has become a critical part of our whole culture, and yet it doesn't exist. So we need to embrace people from the communications media at the Hollywood level into the innovation process as well. And you definitely get some raised eyebrows when you go to a VP of manufacturing and say you want to hire Steven Spielberg, who's probably worth a couple of billion dollars as a consultant. But it's fun. So where does innovation come from? There's really three sources. There's a need, a dissatisfaction, or a curiosity. There's a myth running around that you're either born with innovative skills or you're not. <clears throat> it's not true at all. Innovation is hard work, but it's very easy to learn and it's easy to do. I would contend that any of you could very easily make a list of things that bother you, that bug you, that get you frustrated. <clears throat> and from there, we'll go through the cycle of how you turn that into an actual innovation. But I'll give you one that hit me just about a year ago. I was doing some drywall the house. How many of you have actually done drywalling? You know what an awful mess it is with the spackling and the sanding and you'll do anything to avoid drywall. Well, we came up with a new version of spackle which instead of 
smoothing the spackling trowel, doing three coats <clears throat> and sanding in between them, use a hot clothes iron. It has a slightly expandable thermoplastic in there. <clears throat> so you use uh, the clothes iron and that has a polished stainless steel plate. <clears throat> so it causes the spackle to expand up against it. It heats it at the same time so it's dry and there's no sanding because you're reforming the surface layer as you're smoothing it out. It adds half a cent a pound of the cost of spackle, but decreases the labor cost by a factor of four. <clears throat> well, we're in discussions right now with actually licensing it out. But if anybody ever said, what's the room for spackle in innovation? You know, you've got to be out of your mind. Now, with my course at Wharton, <clears throat> the way I try to teach the kids... <clears throat> And they get upset because I call them kids. But they're in their 20s and 30s, and I'm not, so I, can, I still call them kids. <clears throat> I asked them to consider some fairly complex subjects. I said, okay, I want you to go home, and by next week, think of innovations in sex. And they struggle. It, 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 but, but, you know, not possible. Well, one of the kids proved that it is. <clears throat> How many of you have seen these little... Uh, athletic monitors with the strap around the chest and the wrist receiver to measure your heart rate, heart rate and your, your blood pressure. Well, he started buying those in pairs and swapping the receivers. So by, on your wrist, you could see what your partner was feeling. So he bought a couple of hundred pairs and he sold them last Christmas as sex toys under the name No Faking. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant, but who would have thought that there's room for innovation in sex. So I'm learning you cannot underestimate who is going to come up with an idea. How many of you have seen the <clears throat> infomercials for this little plastic template that enables you to fold shirts to put in your suitcase and it doesn't wrinkle? Well, that was developed by an illiterate Hispanic housekeeper in Texas whose boss used to travel all the time, and he was real mean to her, always complain about how she did the shirts. So she developed the prototype out of cardboard and duct tape. And I think duct tape should, should be a Nobel Prize for that. I think that's one of the greatest inventions of civilization. <clears throat> but he loved the idea, and he funded her to go ahead and do this. Last count, I think they sold 11 million of them. So she's made something like $30 million. She still can't read. So there's this myth that you have to have a PhD or be an executive in order to be innovative. Well, that's not true either. Anybody can innovate. <clears throat> and there's always things that we're dissatisfied about. <clears throat> so the challenge is just recording it and, and listening to it. <clears throat> and, oh, the, uh, curiosity is also a fairly critical one. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, there were some professors who, of medicine who were looking at dissected species which had died of ulcers. And they found a bacterium always <clears throat> in the intestinal tract below the ulcer, <clears throat> uh, Heliobacter pylorus or something like that. And they kept going, well, why is the ulcer causing that? Ultimately, they discovered that wasn't the case at all, that the bacteria were, in fact, causing the ulcer. Up until about five to seven years ago, if you had an ulcer, they'd put you on a bland diet, so you'd get graham cracker mush and all those delightful things. And never really did a very good job of clearing up the ulcers. These guys discovered it's a bacterium which is causing it. So now they put you on antibiotics, and ulcers are gone within a matter of days. Totally revolutionized a major segment of medicine. They just won the Nobel Prize in 2005 for that work. Well, because they were curious. It was, well, why? You know, why did that happen? So just keep an eye out for what do you see that, that's going on? You will always encounter things that will stimulate new thoughts. So how do you actually match the opportunities with technologies? I'm going to give you an, an example uh, in a couple of minutes on that. But there is a myth running around that innovation starts when you already have the idea, you identified the problem, and it's just a matter of taking that and reducing it to practice and turning it into a product. Well, that's not true at all. Innovation starts much earlier than that. That's figuring out really what is the problem that you're dealing with, and then asking some fairly serious questions. Make sure you're dealing with a real problem. And then we'll get into some of the categories of that in a minute. But how many of you have young kids? <clears throat> how many times have you heard, why daddy or why mommy? 
and they'll keep going on and on and on. And after a while, you want to throttle the kids. Will you just shut up? I'm tired of answering your questions. But they're doing exactly the same kind of thing to you that one would hope management would do. Challenging your assumptions. <clears throat> because there's an issue of correlation versus causality. Now, there was a study that was done in the UK where they looked at the relationship between the marriage rate in smaller cities in England versus the amount of grain that was destroyed by rodents in the farms surrounding the communities. And what they found was the lower the marriage rate, the less grain was destroyed by the rodents. Would any of you care to suggest a causality? The correlation was great. The R score is like 0.93. Anybody got any ideas why? Okay. To make a long story short, the lower the marriage rate, obviously, the more single people you have. In England, about 75% of all single people have pets, and the vast majority of those are cats, unlike in the U.S. where they prefer dogs. <clears throat> so that means there are more cats around. The cats would go out at night. They'd catch the rodents, so there weren't as many rodents to eat the grain. But this can be carried to a totally ridiculous extreme. <clears throat> a study that came out of the National Institutes of Health said that 97% of the people who die from lung cancer have nicotine stains between their fingers. <clears throat> So the obvious conclusion is you should come up with soap that will wash the nicotine off their hands and that will prevent lung cancer. <laughs> so you really have to differentiate between what the correlation is and what the causality is. I helped in a study where we were looking at the morality of undergraduates as a function of how they answered several questions on a Ford Foundation study. <clears throat> And we did all the statistics, and we did data mining, and well, we just had fun doing enough number crunching and SQL. I mean, it was a real tour de force in how well we could use the computer. <clears throat> and the number one factor when R squared of over 0.92 was the value of the buildings on campus. The lower the value of the buildings, the more moral the students were. And we jumped through all kinds of hoops trying to explain the physical juxtaposition as a factor in peer pressure and morality. When we got the article accepted for publication, then we noticed all the low endowment schools were Catholic women's colleges, <clears throat> and all the high ones were places like University of Alabama. So there's a bit of a bias built into that that we never even recognized. So just because the computer says it <clears throat> doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So you, a lot of places will erect an edifice in the gospel according to St. Computer. So you really have to go through serious questioning to make sure that you're solving the real problem. <clears throat> now, I have a terrible memory. <clears throat> and I'm seriously bad. And so I write everything down that intrigues me, positively or negatively, or I'm curious about, on a 3 by 5 card. I mean, it doesn't get any lower tech than that. <clears throat> and I hold them together with a rubber band. And periodically, I take out the stack of cards. And over the years, it's grown. So it's about a stack like that right now. <clears throat> I shuffle them, and I deal them out in pairs, and I look at side-by-side -side relationships. <clears throat> what that's done is it's taken everything that I've experienced over all these years and compressed them in time. So something that I liked 15 years ago and something that I just heard today, I can now see side-by-side. -side. I'm much more likely to make connections. A study showed <clears throat> that the further it's been since you heard something, or the further it is from your zone of comfort, the less likely you're going to be able to use it in making a creative or innovative decision. So any cognitive prosthesis that helps do that is a good thing. Now, if you look at the Big Bang Theory, what you see is that the universe is continuing to expand, and the further away you get from the center of the universe, wherever that actually is, <clears throat> the faster it's moving. <clears throat> the same thing holds true in the information you're trying to keep in your head and how you lose track of it. You, we forget so much more than we realize. Any little prosthetic device to help us remember that is incredibly useful. Now, there was a study that was done at the University of Darmstadt where they were looking at low intensity radio frequency, uh, primarily from cell phone towers and the like, to see if that had a deleterious medical effect. And the study didn't find anything, but there was a very curious footnote, because they were doing this on rats. I mean, they had a choice. Rats are politicians. They chose the easy one. <clears throat> they said that the rats who were exposed to this tended to have better memories, 
than the rats who were not. Is it possible that that was giving us a clue that when the brain is at rest, it's taking all the short-term stuff that is heard and trying to build the long-term relations between them? Could we use RFID, or radio frequency, to make the brain work faster while we're asleep or remember different things? A similar study showed that if you force somebody to remember something, each time you force them, it's harder for them the next time to remember it. The brain has already built up its pathway saying, I don't want to do this, so it fights harder. So the three by five cards is totally benign. Nobody has ever developed an emotional disgust for a three by five card. They may not like the color of the rubber band I use, but, but that's it. But let me give you a very specific example from this. One of my students came in one day and he said, I just love touchscreen technology. That's going to solve all the problems of civilization. Now, MBA students tend to hyperbolize just a bit, and their grandiloquence is unique, but this is what he believed. <clears throat> Another student <clears throat> in the same class said, yeah, but, but, but I was at King of Prussia Mall last Saturday night with my girlfriend, and we went down to the Cheesecake Factory restaurant. There was an hour and a half to get in, so we had to sit there the whole time waiting for a table. In the meantime, she got hypoglycemic. We got into a fight, and we broke up. So my challenge to the students was take those two things, the event of the mall and touchscreen technology and turn it into a profitable business. And they thought I was smoking something you didn't get at the corner drugstore. But after a week to chew on it, there was a very obvious answer. They've now developed this one of their projects, kiosks that you can put in shopping malls that enable you to get on the waiting list for restaurants anywhere else in the mall from wherever you are. But they had a really neat upgrade to it. And that was slide your charge card through the kiosk and you can pre-order your food. When you go to a restaurant at a mall, you're not going for the dining experience. You want to get in and out as fast as you can. <clears throat> By ordering and charging it to your card, when you get there, your food's ready and waiting for you. You're not tying up the most critical asset or resource of the restaurant, which is table space, waiting for somebody to take your order, waiting for your food to be cooked, and waiting to pay your check. So a queuing analysis we did with the folks at Cornell showed that a typical busy restaurant can get almost three times as many people through in the same elapsed time with no increased labor costs. Uh, well, then we learned something that I really didn't know, and that was that if you are renting space at a big shopping mall, you pay a fixed fee plus a percentage of your revenues to the mall owner. So now, if you make more money, you pay more rent, but you're happy to do that because you're making more money. So the owner of the King of Prussia Mall right now is paying two of my students to actually commercialize this. So they're paying all the R&D costs, and that's going to be their gift to us, and we'll get a royalty on every transaction that goes through the kiosks. Everybody wins. And the ones who are going to win even bigger actually turn out to be the stores at the mall because if you're not sitting in a restaurant, you're shopping. So more money is changing hands per unit hour. And then there was an even more fun study that came out of the University of Delaware School of Hotel Management where they looked at the bell-shaped curve of when people are willing to eat as a function of price. And found that the restaurants that offer pre-theater specials, for example, people will come and eat earlier. Or if you have a later evening discount, they'll eat, early. They'll eat later. But restaurants can't afford to have different menus as a function of what time you come, except under very limited circumstances. So now by running your charge card through, it knows what time you're eating and knows what to charge you for the meals. So when we did a focus group, we found that instead of it being over about a 90-minute to two-hour window at the mall, people would spread out to almost four hours for just a 15% discount. The restaurant's still making a ton of money on it. So here was just a case of you know, the left hand and the right hand coming together. Because who would have thought? And then we had a presentation <clears throat> by a guy who owns a number of major golf courses. I'm not a golfer, so I was incredibly naive about all this. <clears throat> but what he told me is that the greens in a good golf course have to get mowed every single day. Because <clears throat> you want to have a really consistent look and feel, if you'll forgive the computer term. <clears throat> so as a result of that, <clears throat> they normally have at least a dozen people whose sole job is just maintaining the greens. <clears throat> So we took one of these little Roombas, the little room vacuum cleaners that bounce off the walls and will clean your house while you're away. 
merged that with invisible fence technology, which is used for keeping dogs under control, and turned the Roomba into a lawnmower rather than a vacuum cleaner. And so now the golf course, which is testing this out, they drop one of our, we call them Zumbas, <clears throat> on the green each night. They come back the next morning, the green is perfectly mowed to a thousandth of an inch. You pick it up and they're done. Saving them over a million dollars a year. We're not smart, it's just you get enough people together who have different problems, <clears throat> and you know the different solution spaces, you can put it all together, and if you've asked the right question, you can make a ton of money on the deal at the same time. But the thing you have to worry about is what may appear to be a problem may not actually be one. One of the exercises I gave my class was, I want you to speed up the game of golf. And they, they quickly figured out that the rate-limiting step in playing golf is hunting for lost golf balls but didn't recognize that if your golf is so poor you lose balls, it's really not a competitive sport for you. It is a social event, and you're happy to lose the balls because it gives you a chance to chat with your buddies. The golf ball manufacturers want you to continue to lose balls because they sell more balls. The country clubs want you to play slowly because less wear and tear on the golf course and they get paid anyway. So, what it boiled down to is here's something we thought was a big problem. In fact, it isn't. But as Phil mentioned, I get kids involved in this course as well. Because children are so much, much more innovative and more energetic in their lateral thinking than we are. My son, who was seven at the time, listened, and after about one minute, he raised his hand and said, Well, Daddy, that's an easy one. Girl dogs smell different than boy dogs. So take whatever it is that makes a girl dog smell the way she does, spray it on the golf ball, and then bring a boy dog with you because his nose is about a thousand times more sensitive than a human's. It was an absolutely brilliant solution. And yet, not one single adult who's taken my course had ever thought of it. So I would contend that at a place like Microsoft, rather than look at kids as just customers, look at kids as ideas. They will ask things that you'd never even think of. If you look at how much of the economy is driven by kids, and they're, Daddy, buy me, or I'm going to throw a tantrum, or all the other kids are doing it, so I want one too. It's astonishing. They are the biggest unrecognized force in the economy. Now, there's a material which we develop at my institute. Uh, I went to the folks at DuPont, and this is going to sound horribly sexist, but I said, I've spent much too much of my life waiting in women's shoe departments while shoes get tried on and put back because they don't fit quite right. I said, let's come up with a material that you can incorporate into the lining of the shoes and adjust the thickness right there in the store so the shoe fits perfectly. Well, I actually invented such a material. The little tiny thermoplastic microspheres, they're hollow and they're filled with an inert hydrocarbon. When you heat them, the plastic of the sphere softens. The hydrocarbon boils, so that expands it like a balloon. But since it's spherically symmetrical, it can't recompress. So we made a layer. It's about a half a millimeter thick. When you heat it, it goes to one and a half millimeters thick. But if you look at the, the shoe industry, what you'll discover is the, the width difference between a wide, a medium, and a narrow is one millimeter between wide, medium, and one between medium and narrow. So we're in test with this right now with Prada and Ferragamo. And the reason they love it is it will cut their SKUs by a factor of three. They're only making wides, and you can adjust it with a, a hairdryer right there in the store by thickening the walls to make it fit perfectly. And they're even more predatory in their pricing than certain software companies we all have heard about. It's going to be about four cents worth of material in a pair of shoes. And Ferragamo is going to charge an extra $75 a pair on the trade name Perfect Fit. Now, I like that kind of profit margin. So it's a case of you look at different things, and the question is, can you put them together? The question which we were, were then challenged by DuPont about was, Okay, that's, that's great for shoes. What else can you do with it? And the reason I'm giving you some of these examples is to show you that we're all very, very narrowly focused. We come up with a solution to a problem, but no one has ever incented us, at least in the corporate world, to try to come up with other things that technology can do. We're paid to do a job. We're not paid to do other jobs as well. So we experimented with this a little bit. And we found that you can inject it into cancerous tumors. 
what it does is it clogs the blood vessels in inside the tumor, and the tumor suffocates and dies. So it's non-surgical, non-pharmaceutical treatment for cancer. It's in clinical test right now. Unfortunately, DuPont owns it. We don't own that one. That's the same material that's in the spackle. We've also found that you can force it into wood and then expand it once it's inside the pores of the wood, and now you have a totally benign alternative pressure-treated lumber that has no environmental difficulties. It's been estimated that the cost to the U.S. economy by failure to use adequate concrete and maintain it properly is about $400 billion a year in deferred maintenance. We found if you mix this stuff with concrete, it gives you the what used to be just entrained air, but it doesn't allow water or bacteria to get into the rebar. And so we're in the process of selling this to one of the major concrete manufacturers right now, and they estimate it'll give them much more durable concrete that they can charge a 20% premium on. One cent a pound for this material and the concrete. Not a bad profit margin, but everything you see and hear and do <clears throat> is an interesting opportunity for you. And Microsoft is beautifully... Yes, ma'am. In that particular case, uh, we came up with an afternoon. We were lucky. But the more things that you basically stack up on your desk, the more things you talk about, the more likely you are to find a, a solution. Now, I'm going to jump ahead for a minute. There was a study that was done by the CIA where they took intelligence data and they had varying numbers of experts look at it. And what they found is the more experts you have involved with it, the more likely they are to come to the same conclusion and be confident of it, but the accuracy did not go up. <clears throat> so there's a major peril to groupthink. If you get a bunch of people who all have similar backgrounds, looking at the same set of problems, they'll quickly focus on one solution. And everybody will say, yeah, that's great. That's going to work. That's perfect solution. That is a very easy way to crush innovation. Now, <clears throat> there's... Let's go on to the next one. <clears throat> there are some problems that we all know and we love and we'd love to see them solved, except the people who have the ability to solve them don't want them solved. How many of you ever waited at a doctor's office because the doctor's running behind schedule? Pretty much all of us. Wouldn't it be nice if you could have a PDA or cell phone based system so the doctor's office could say, we're running about 90 minutes late, so come and say 3.15 for your 2 o'clock appointment. Sure, and they value your time. You ever heard of a doctor doing that? No. <clears throat> Will you? Absolutely not. Because that gives Medicare and the insurance companies another thing to hang, over the, hang the doctor on. So they're disincented to do it. And it costs the doctor money to give you that information. And they're not going to make any more money as a result. Unless you change the game. <clears throat> We sat down with one of the big drug companies and have convinced them now they will fund such a system. They will pay the doctor to provide that information. So the doctor will make more money out of it. But in return, you've got to listen to one of the drug company's ads right before you find out when to really go for your appointment. <clears throat> Since right now they know everything you're taking, as Scott McNeely put it so eloquently, you think you have privacy? No. Get over it. <clears throat> you don't. The drug companies know right now every medication any of you are taking. So if they've got a competitive drug, it's in their best interest to say, ah, you should switch over from Prilosec to Nexium. And in a focus group we did, it worked. Much more effective, uh, dollars and cents point of view, than the ads they run on television. Because millions of people see the ad for Nexium, but if you don't have the heartbreak of acid reflux disease or whatever, you ignore it. But if you're walking into the doctor's office, you're going to listen real well. So here's a way of finding somebody else to pay for <clears throat> what's going on. Sometimes technology is absolutely brilliant, <clears throat> but it's not making any money because they're tackling the wrong problem. How many of you remember the Sony Ibo, <clears throat> little robot dog? They were cool. They really were. <clears throat> they had little TV cameras in there and microphones, so... You could teach the dog to do tricks. It would recognize when the battery was running down, and it would go and plug itself in. We bought a couple on an experiment. We were working with one of the children's hospitals because kids who are sick need all the emotional comfort they can possibly get. 
So we put some of the IBOs in there. They can't carry disease, they can't scratch, and quickly the child would learn how to communicate with the IBO. Even kids who were autistic didn't feel threatened by these little robot dogs. And where we were headed with the pilot was that when the kids would leave the hospital, they'd get to take the IBO home with them. Why on earth would we want to give them a $1,000 going away present? Over 70% of all the readmits of children to hospitals who've been seriously ill is because once they start to feel better, they won't take their medication anymore or they forget. So we programmed the IBOs to remind you to take your medication. And we found that kids, if their dog tells them to do it, are much more cooperative than if their parents tell them to do it. A child, a seriously ill child in the hospital, costs about $1,500 a day. So to give them a $1,000 take home, they'll, they'll continue to play with it for a long time and maybe avoid even 10% getting readmitted. You paid for that in hours. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Sony decided they weren't making enough money because they were going after the wrong target, <clears throat> and they ab abandoned it. So we're in discussions right now with Sony to try to buy the rights to that. But they're being a little bit pig-headed, <clears throat> and they say we've got to buy the factory too. And you know, <clears throat> But here's a perfect example of how there's huge money to be made based on robotics technology, which I know you guys have got the equivalent of here. But I doubt that Microsoft ever thought about going after helping kids stay out of the hospital. It's great payback, it's wonderful publicity, and it's going to be real hard for somebody to think, well, we should sue Microsoft for being predatory in how they do things because my kid loves this little thing and he's taking his medication so he's going to be fine. Let's take the state of Florida as an example. <clears throat> They are under major court order to take a lot of the mentally ill prisoners in their prison system and put them in mental hospitals. They don't have nearly enough hospital beds. Because what they've started to do is take people with cognitive impairments and just warehouse them in psychiatric hospitals, where really all they need is just a little bit of a daily assist. Uh, having an 85-year-old mother, I can tell you that in, neither insurance companies nor Medicare will pay for what they call supportive nursing or domestic help. I'm paying $2,500 a week to have somebody help my mother take a bath, remember to take her medicine, and things like that, because no insurance company will pay for it. Well, as a result, uh, as of December 1st, Florida is going to start having to pay a fine of $1,000 per patient who has not been moved to a psychiatric hospital per day. And they're estimating it's going to take them, if they can even come up with the money, three to five years to build and staff enough psychiatric hospitals for them. So if you can find a way to use your robotic technology as a cognitive assist to help the people who don't need to be in a psychiatric hospital live at home, so you've got freed up beds for the people who really need it, they're currently estimating that it's going to be costing Florida something like $1.7 million a day in fines. I mean, that's big money, even for a place like here. Another issue that we looked at was nail polish. My ex-wife was a fanatic about getting her nails done every week. And she'd be there for three, four hours at a stretch. So we developed a whole new variety of nail polish that was ultraviolet curable. You put it on and it was dry in 15 seconds. So you come in, get your nails done, and you go. Absolute dud. Fell completely flat on his face. You don't go to, the, to a nail salon to get your nails done. You go because it's a cheap psychiatrist to talk to. <clears throat> the nail clinicians just love to chatter and they're very happy to spend an hour listening to the women there. And I'm sorry if that sounds sexy, but I don't know too many guys who go in to get their nails done. <clears throat> the women can complain about their husbands and their kids, and the nail person is very happy to listen. So you have to look at, are you really solving a problem that somebody else has? What made it fun with this nail polish <clears throat> is we then went and talked to the folks at General Motors, <clears throat> and they did a focus group and found that teenage girls went absolutely crazy at the idea of having nail polish that would be the same color as their car. 
So they're going to start a test marketing, I think, in 2008 model year, <clears throat> where if you're under the age of 21, they'll give you some free bottles of nail polish so you can match your car. And they think it's going to make them money. So whatever. Now I can give you a whole bunch of <clears throat> more examples, but I won't go through all of them now in the interest of time. <clears throat> Uh, bottled water industry. How many of you drink bottled water now? Do you really notice a difference or are we all sheep? Is there a difference between Dasani and Aquapure? The answer is no, not really. And a lot of this stuff which they claim is mountain fresh. And there's one plant, and I think it's in Rochester, where the plant happens to be on Mountain Avenue. So they can call it mountain spring water. It's taken right out of the municipal water system. But let's look at Fiji water as an example. That's the most expensive out there right now. The assignment I gave my students was I said, I want you to double the price of Fiji water, and I want you to double the market share at the same time. And they said, you're smoking dope. It can't be done. But of course it can if you just think about it. And this is the same kind of scenario you folks are running across. They're not going to start selling Fiji water ice cubes. And the argument's going to be, if you won't drink it, drink it straight, why are you putting in ice cubes to cool the beverages you're going to drink? And then they, and from there they designed ice trays. So instead of being ice cubes, they're replicas of the Fiji Islands. <clears throat> so you're showing your guests how much you respect them by giving them Fiji cubes, not ice cubes. <clears throat> and then they designed, and it only took them an afternoon, a little docking system so you can only fill the Fiji water tray from a Fiji bottle, the square bottle. Fiji love the idea. They're going to start marketing that in Phoenix, I think, in March. They like the idea so much they sent my class 100 cases of Fiji water as a thank you. And what I think they're going to find is that people are going to say, I am not paying that for your damn ice cubes. I will buy the trays and I'll make them myself. That's how you get your volume up. So it's just changing the dynamics of the market. And the one that's the most fun, as far as I'm concerned, how many of you have ever looked at a car's engine when it's actually running? Do you have a sense of how hot the exhaust manifold really gets? It's about 1,200 degrees or thereabouts. So for the fun of it, we build a little heat exchange that takes some of that heat and recirculates very hot liquid uh, through a closed loop system back into the car. And then we design a little pizza oven that goes there. And we're finishing up the prototype with Domino's right now. And what will happen is they will prepare the pizza at the restaurant, but then they will cook it while it's on the way to you. So you'll never have a stale, dry, gooey pizza again. <clears throat> so that, that's just a marketing ploy. And marketing is good. Some of my best friends are marketers. But there's another thing how it changes the game. They figured out they can get by with half as many ovens at the restaurant <clears throat> because they're not cooking the pizzas there. So there's less utility cost, less capital, and less air conditioning to counteract all the heat from the ovens. So the typical restaurant estimates they'll have payback within about four months, including outfitting all their delivery cars with these little engines. I know none of you drive long-haul trucks as a weekend avocation. Oh, maybe you do. I don't know. Have you noticed how at the truck stops, the truck drivers keep the engines running all the time? Now, why is that? <clears throat> the biggest reason is to provide heat when it's cold. Now, is there a problem with this? Well, yeah, you're <clears throat> using up all this additional fuel, generating all this additional pollution. Folks at Freightliner told us that that sh shrinks the lifespan of an engine by 50% because you're running in non-optimal conditions. So you think, well, if there's all these things why it shouldn't be done, why are people still doing it? Well, <clears throat> there are little phase change materials that are used in solar heating, uh, various kinds of salts. <clears throat> so I built a prototype for them. <clears throat> it's basically like a very thick cafeteria tray that slides underneath the seat in the cab. <clears throat> and before you're going to stop, you turn the heat exchanger on. It melts that. And over the space of several hours, as it recrystallizes, is giving off all this heat, and the cab stays perfectly warm. Another reason that people haven't wanted to turn off the engines is if the glow plugs get cold, a diesel engine sometimes won't restart. <clears throat> so we built a little version of that. 
essentially little hot water bottles for the glow plugs. <clears throat> so it's looking like we'll be able to cut the cost <clears throat> of long-range trucking by about 20 percent, about $10 worth of material per truck. Again, it's just open your eyes to all of what's going on around you. Talk to one another <clears throat> about what you see, what you like, what you don't like, and you'll be amazed at how many things will happen. But now we're going to come to the dark side <clears throat> of all this. This is an exercise I gave my students one day. I said, okay, I want five things from you. I want you to eliminate all pollution in the United States in 30 days. I want you to send a man to the moon for a dollar or less. I want a time machine. And I want you to move the Rocky Mountains. And I want you to raise a billion dollars by lunchtime tomorrow. You have 30 minutes. And they were struggling away like mad. <clears throat> At the end of 30 minutes, they turned in their papers, tore them up and threw them in the trash, and said, you all flunked. They were outraged. I said, OK, let's look at what happened. You assumed <clears throat> I had def correctly identified what the problem is, evaluated the value proposition, enumerated all the different solutions to it, evaluated each one of those, knew which was the best one. <clears throat> and your only responsibility to the organization is to be a good little soldier and do exactly what I tell you. Now, one of you asked a single question. Is like, um, uh, yeah. OK. So finally, one girl raised her hand and said, well, can I ask, well, why did you want to move the Rocky Mountains? Because I figure that's you know, take 300 years and cost tens of trillions of dollars. It'll sure mess up the environment. And I don't know where we put the rocks anyway. I said, well, I'd like to have a house in Colorado. And I love a view of the Pacific Ocean. So the, the mountains get in the way. Said, oh, well, that's easy. Don't put a window there, put in a webcam. So instead of 300 years and $100 trillion, it was $15 and 15 minutes. So I would encourage you, whenever management says, go do something, say why. What are your assumptions? Why do you think this is the right thing? How do you know we're going to get paid for it? Initially, you'll encounter a lot of ego from management of, how dare you challenge me? But after a while, they're going to appreciate that there's more of you, and you see things in the different things. How many of you are Star Trek fans? Good. Remember the Borg and their collective consciousness? Whenever anybody heard something, that knowledge was instantly available to the rest of the, the collective. Now, there are some ways we could actually make a software equivalent of that. But you can become a Borg-like environment here <clears throat> if you can overcome just some of the cultural barriers and convince management they should be listening to you in an up and down manner. <clears throat> we ran a test at Berg Electronics. Most of my clients won't let me talk about them, but Berg will. <clears throat> Gave 50 people in the organization a sheet of paper. On the front, you're supposed to write, who listens to you? In the back, who do you listen to? The results were absolutely breathtaking. It did not mirror the org chart in any way, shape, or form. People thought their management was listening to them. They weren't. <clears throat> there were some folks, we even had some secretaries there, who didn't realize they were the confidants <clears throat> of executive vice presidents. The point being, if you don't know who's listening to you and you don't know who you're listening to, how do you expect the organization to hear? So it's a really fun experiment, even within a group or a division, to just try taking that one sheet of paper exercise. I think you'll be astounded with what you see. Now, <clears throat> it's real easy to stand up here and say, hey, innovation is really neat and cool, and everybody should do it, and here's why. <clears throat> but the organization's got to respect you for doing it, and they've got to come up with a way of compensating you for doing it. Because if you're spending time innovating, you're not doing what they've told you to do. Because I've seen very few managers who really mean it when they say, stop what you're doing. Everything I've told you up until now was not all that important. But go and create you know, great new things for us. So they have to find a way to encourage you to do this. And this works all the way up and down the line. But what we did at one of my companies, <clears throat> set up a national account with an 800 number at Domino's Pizza. Whenever you saw somebody who was doing a good job, you could call the 800 number and get a pizza sent to them. Now, when bonuses come out, you never want to talk about how much you got, because that generates a lot of rivalry. Why did he get $4,500 and I only got 3000 And usually the money goes to pay taxes or heating bills or things like that. 
and there's no recognition for it. Mm. So with this pizza approach, mm. whenever you thought somebody had done a really good job, you send them two large pizzas, because there's not a soul I've ever met, except maybe one teenage boy, who can eat two large pizzas. They have to share. The smell is everywhere, so everybody knows, hey, somebody else just got recognized by management or by somebody else. And then they come and they, they eat some of the pizza. Nobody feels threatened that, well, the pizza was delivered to him, but I get some of it too, so it's fine. The budget for employee recognition in my company went down by a factor of 80%, and morale just absolutely skyrocketed. People loved it. We also did something that was really heretical, and that was we started including families. Because when a team really gets together and works hard and gets something out the door, who's made the most sacrifice of that? Your family. Less time with them, and they're the ones who are bearing the brunt of it. Organizations need to do a much better job if they want innovation of saying thank you to the families. So whenever we had a team that really succeeded, what we would do is we would arrange limos to go pick up the team member and their spouse and provide a babysitter, take them off to a very elegant dinner at the restaurant of their choice on us. It wound up costing us about $500 per family when the team accomplished something. But people were talking about those dinners for years created such an enormous goodwill. And we never measured the actual divorce rate of our employees, <clears throat> but we have a gut feeling it went way down because the families recognized <clears throat> that the company cared about them as well. So they would even start feeding their innovative ideas back to the company through their spouse. And we got quite a number of really neat suggestions. Uh, but just, it really didn't cost very much. But does corporate America listen to this? No. <clears throat> One of my clients came up with a great idea, and they just sent this to me last week. They said, we finally decided it's time to start having a special compensation program for our innovators. So if a team comes up with a business that generates at least $20 million a year in revenue, we're going to split $60,000 among the whole team. And oh, by the way, the manager of the group is going to get 50% of that. How many of you think that's a good idea? But have you seen things like that around here? You don't, have, you don't have to answer this being taped. But in all seriousness, what was wrong with that is you're not compensating the people who actually did the work. You're giving the majority of the money to the person who's rotated through that position, just happens to be there when the thing turns successful. There's a totally unreasonable relationship between how much money is being made and how much you give to the people. And it's also sending the wrong message. If you think about it, a bonus is designed to reward for past performance and stimulate future performance and encourage the organization to learn from the successes that have taken place. Well, you're giving a pittance to the folks who actually did the work. You're rewarding somebody who had very little to do with the success of the team, and it never spreads any further. So we've pushed back on them now and said, give the manager of the group 5%, split 95% amongst the team, but give the manager a promotion. So if the manager really continues to do a good job and has learned from this, they'll be drinking from a larger salary and bonus pool. So if they continue to do well, they'll have a much greater upside opportunity, and the promotion increases their span of control so more of the organization learns from it. You'd think we were smoking dope for suggesting this to the company, but I think they're going to wind up doing it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's just close off with... What are we doing with all this? Because, as Philip said, it's one thing to stand up here and say, oh, wearing my ivory tower hat at a prestigious business school, these things ought to work. And here's the five books I've written about it. I've returned to my investors in my company so far over $1 billion on $5.6 million of investment. So clearly something we're doing here is working. But there's... All right, let's be crass about it. <clears throat> How many of you come up with a really neat idea that you just couldn't get the company to do anything with? No matter how hard you tried, you knew it was going to succeed. There's no downside <clears throat> to an SBU saying no to your idea. They can toss it in the trash. It never shows up on the balance sheet. <clears throat> the sunk cost of the IP, gone. But nobody notices it. never reported anywhere. The fact that you get demotivated and disenfranchised and you may wind up leaving, well, you know, big deal. <clears throat> As we pointed out at DuPont, 
the average resident of Dade County, Florida, is born Hispanic and dies Jewish. Think about it for a minute. It's true. And the CEO said, well, what the hell does that have to do with DuPont? <clears throat> it's very simple. You're taking your most senior, experienced people who know your business, your technology, and your customers, and you're pushing them into retirement. <clears throat> and you're bringing in new people who are younger and you can get for cheaper, who come from an entirely different cultural background. You bring them in <clears throat> essentially as slave labor. You work them to death for three or four years, so they get tired and they leave. So what you're doing is you're burning a bridge at both ends. Corporate America has got to recognize that the more experience you have, the more valuable you are, the more things you know, the more pieces you can put together. <clears throat> so that's where the, the Borg comes in. <clears throat> but uh, what this institute does is lets companies transfer IP that they're not going to do anything with <clears throat> to the institute. The institute can then go ahead and finish developing it. The company can buy it back if they want to. But if they decide they don't want to, because it's not strategic, they're not bearing the technology anymore. <clears throat> it can now be sold to somebody else who will run with it, and then the company that provided it in the first place now gets royalties on it. So they're not landfilling all of your great ideas. It's an alternative way of commercializing it <clears throat> and making some money out of the deal. Now, you may be thinking, well, you know, we could just give this stuff to universities. The Job Creation Act of 2004 made that essentially impossible. You cannot get a tax deduction anymore for giving some to the universities because a number of companies abused the system very, very badly. We know of one company that donated some patents to one of the southern universities and took a $35 million deduction for it. The following year, the university took that same technology and sold it to the original company's competitors for $500,000. And the IRS came down and said, well, now explain to me what happened in a year that dropped the value from 35 million to 500,000. So it's things like that that caused <clears throat> this to be what it is. So what an institute like Structure does is it lets you take things that you're not going to do something with, move it off into a place where it can be commercialized so you still get upside, <clears throat> and the institute <clears throat> can then resell it, license it, do whatever. <clears throat> now it's a third party transaction at arm's length, <clears throat> so the value of the contribution is no longer subject to the vagaries of what PwC or KPMG <clears throat> says it's worth, and everybody makes money out of the deal. And the last thing <clears throat> that we've been working on, which you get a chuckle out of, <clears throat> is an inverse auction on intellectual property. <clears throat> Things that a company doesn't want to take back, the institute will go out and license. First person to buy it pays X. Second person to buy it pays 2X. Third person pays 3X. Now we've given you a time value we're encouraging you. The longer you wait to make up your mind, the more it costs you. And we've already found a couple of companies that are buying licensing technologies from the Institute to raise the barrier to entry to their competition. And it's all perfectly legal. So what I've really tried to say to you in this hour is innovation is something a company doesn't know how to deal with because there's all kinds of turf issues which are involved. There are different ways to skin the cat different ways you can communicate back to your management. And if they choose not to listen, you're no longer in the position. If you want to do something with it, you've got to quit. And Microsoft has got, I don't want to think how many of you are involved in research, but it's got to be a staggering number. The amount of intellectual property which is just sitting on shelves, which is not going to make any money for the shareholders or the employees or anybody, is growing by hundreds of millions of dollars, not billions of dollars a year. It's time for almost a revolution to force management to open their eyes and realize there are other ways to make money out of it rather than just them commercializing it themselves. I'm close by reminding you of that great scene from the movie Network when everybody's sticking their head out the window of the building and yelling, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it any longer. Fight back, you'll all wind up coming out ahead. I'd be happy to answer any questions or dodge any knives that you want to throw. The one for treating cancer, <clears throat> because current estimates are tens of thousands of people's lives a year will be saved by this. Um, 
The pizza oven I'm actually sort of proud of <clears throat> because it's so idiot simple. And the spackle. Sometimes, I mean, anybody can innovate. Go and ask your kids what they like. And you'd be astonished by what they come up with. So those are probably my top three. And they're fun. If you're not having fun, since eBay is not selling fun out there. And by the way, if you want a really great book to read, the chief creative officer at Sony, Raphael Koster, has written a fabulous book entitled The Theory of Fun, as it applies to games. Brilliant study of what really turns people on when they're playing the games. I commend it to you highly. It's a great read. Yes, sir. Outlive your top points for successful entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. <clears throat> okay. <sighs> Let's look at the scenario I described of a two by two matrix and assume that you come up with something that your management doesn't know about. You go to your boss and you say, hey, we've got this really horrendous problem over here, but I've got a solution. Now they go to their boss and say, hey, we've got this really serious problem, but my guys have come up with a solution. So what it enables you to do is turn your customers into your salespeople, giving each of them a chance to win politically as they take your idea and run with it. It's not, it's the reverse of the situation where they've got to say, well, my people thought of this, but I didn't. Where every step up the line, you're having to deal with a defensive situation. It's a way of offensive marketing, if you will. And everybody loves it. So the suggestion is to let it bubble up organically and not do end runs? Is that a end nice runs nonsense? don't usually work. As Don Corleone put it, revenge tastes best when it's bitter cold. And management always has the chance to exact revenge when it comes to salaries, promotions, or transfers to you know, northern Minnesota in January. And we've done some of those. <clears throat> But the first thing is, make sure, well, all right. My grandfather had a great description. He said, if you want to get your management to buy into something, paint the least obvious 95% of the problem for them. So they'll think of the 5% that's most obvious, and now they feel they've been a contributor, and now they will embrace it. So no matter how obvious it is, don't tell them. Let them think of it. It's amazing how fast they'll run with it then. Can we delete that from the video? <laughs> Yes, sir. So you had a lot of nice examples of where innovation works, or innovation works, um, and a couple of kind of areas where it doesn't. But it might be instructive to find out where you tried something and failed. Where the idea was good, the, you thought the market was good and ripe and ready for it, but... Well, <clears throat> the golf balls was one. <clears throat> uh, there's one that I didn't have on the list here. <clears throat> we looked at, <clears throat> let me think of just how to explain this tactfully. We're doing a lot of work with trying to understand text. <clears throat> We're trying to, because there's so much email going on and there's so much information which is captured that never makes it to a lab notebook, which makes patenting a very dicey situation especially as long as the U.S. held to the position that it was first to discover, not first to file. Well, our legal department saw what we were doing. They said, well, we've got this horrendous problem over here that there are allegations of sex and race discrimination at some of our facilities down in the southern United States. Can you use your neat tools to look at that and find out, are we really guilty of it? I won't recite some of the profanity, which was in the emails, but we quickly discovered that there was a difference. And they shut us down in a heartbeat and said, you've got to stop the project, burn the results, pretend this never happened. Because if you discover it, then we're bound by law to submit it to the court. So it was a technological stunning success and a business failure of catastrophic proportions. We, it looked like we were going to find things which would cost the company hundreds of millions of dollars. So we were told to stop. So be careful what you wish for. You might find it. So that's probably our biggest failure. But I'm still proud of it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. A lot of uh, examples that you have provided um, were uh, innovation, innovation in response to a specific need that you, know, you didn't know existed, but they mm. often um, 
targeted a niche, so golfers or people who have yeah. cancer or whatever, you know, to underestimate the, the, the impact. But then how do you go and innovate with something, with a product that's out there that's for everybody, like Windows? Well, it's funny you ask that because my mother's 85 years old and we just moved her from her old Mac SE to a brand new XP machine. That's about as big a culture shock as you can imagine. <clears throat> Listening to her questions about, well, how do I, those are fairly easy, but it's the what do I, what can I do with all this? <clears throat> so my contention is that Microsoft needs to do a much better job of talking to senior citizens, let's say age well, 50 and up. <clears throat> I mean, if you're eligible for AARP, you're senior in my terms. <clears throat> they don't even know what's possible. You remember when Woodward and Bernstein were in the basement of the parking garage with well, deep a deep thought, deep throat, and they said, is there anything else we should be asking you? There was an enormous number of things that people would like to do with Windows, but they don't know that some of it's possible, some is not. They don't even know how to ask the question. Now, Apple's done a nice job with some of their iLife series, but there's so much that we'd like to be able to do. We don't know how to do We don't even know how to ask the question of you. I'd love to sit down with some of your development people and say, these are all the problems I face. Is it possible in Windows or in Vista, the next generation? Can you do something about it? But my contention is most of what I'm going to ask for, you've already done in Microsoft Research, and you don't know I need. So the big step is go out and ask. Uh, we had a scenario like this at DuPont where I said to my boss, I want to have national account managers for people who aren't buying anything from us. And he looked at me like I was out of my mind. He said, but why do you want to do that? I said, because I don't know why they're not buying from us. <clears throat> All of our national account managers were talking to our good customers. How much does Microsoft know about why people don't buy their software? And what also makes it fun, with my class of Wharton, I would bring the elementary school kids in at the same time as I was teaching the graduate students and watching how they, each of those two groups, watched how the other group learned, what kinds of questions they asked, stimulated all kinds of neat new thinking. So if I was Bill Gates or Ray Ossie, whatever, I'd set up a focus group with eight-year-olds and 80-year-olds at the same time and see what kind of cross-fertilization you'd come from that. I'll bet you'd get a whole bunch of really interesting new ideas of how to use Windows. And then bring in some of the people from Star Trek so we can finally get the Borg. Yes, yeah, we have a called Real People, Real Data, where they go out and recruit families to give us this kind of feedback. How do you actually run that project? Mm. Do you, uh, you said... I went to some families in Phoenix, talked to them, and we actually go visit them in situ, so to say. And you're guided by one of the anthropologists. Yeah, right? we go with actually, uh, there's a bunch of ethnographers and anthropologists. Uh, yeah, we, I went to the user engineer, but there are anthropologists who run this. And they Is that helping? Changed. Oh, yeah, I mean, a lot of things came out. They, uh, yeah, a lot of small changes and some things like the Windows, uh, what I call the developing country editions. Um, and they claim the came out of it. Good. I'm delighted. And they also target different sections. They have a uh, no knowledge worker program, which you know you go and adopt somebody, go visit them, find out what their problems are. And you suggest solutions, not all of them get accepted, but some things happen. Yes. Now that Windows has been declared a monopoly, there probably one more to not use Windows to get out of the monopoly thing. They're very happy that Apple is not running on x86. That immediately gives you 5% market share of non-Windows guys. The monopoly issue is a scary one. I think Shakespeare put it fairly well when he said, first we kill all the lawyers. Uh, I look at areas of the the robot for the, the kids' treatment, or the, the cognitive prosthesis for people with um, Alzheimer's. Nobody's going to claim you're being a monopolist if you start to branch out into new things. But again, it's easy for me sitting in Wilmington, Delaware, to study what Redmond should do. But if you reach out there, now you work back, you interpolate from 
where people are not going to complain at all about what you do to where they complain a lot. And there will be a lot of middle ground in there where a lot of good, clean money can be made. I'm not against making money. I happen to like it. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So, something I've noticed with the suggestions coming out of the sort of site visits that you talked about um, kind of reinforces, for me at least, some of the premises that Christensen makes in The Innovator's Dilemma, that we have become better at accepting the suggestions that are more of the sustaining sort than the disruptive sort. And I'm just wondering, do you, do you also buy into the notion of the innovator's dilemma and have thoughts on how Microsoft ought to be thinking about how to deal with it? Well, based on the other companies I've worked with, because I really don't know any of your internals or your politics, and I, I get to read the stilted media like anybody else, the biggest enemy of corporate change is HR. They are so deathly afraid of creating any kind of precedent that will enable different sets of employees to be treated differently. One of the Fortune 10 companies decided they couldn't measure the output and contribution of their research people. So instead of rewarding them based on their contribution, they drove all of them to a similar salary grade target. The result of that was the best performers got lower raises to push them down to the median and the poorer performers got bigger raises to move them up to the median. So if you can get HR to accept that there's really a big difference between how you treat research people whose contribution may not be dollars and cents this year, but may be a fundamental technology that will make earth-shaking change five years from now, if you can get HR to buy into that, the rest will follow fairly quickly. But HR and legal have always been the, the big stumbling blocks with my clients. Do you find that to be sort of true here? To some extent, although, you know, there's another issue of if you have an idea that you want to, if, if, if you don't already own a bunch of headcount, right, mm -hmm. and you have an idea that needs people to pull it off, you have to go propose it to someone who has the ability to allocate some headcount to it. And those people often seem to strike me as being far more receptive to the sustaining kind of concepts, the things that will further our existing business as opposed to the ones that will disrupt it. That's characteristic of all American industry and even the European com country companies I've been talking to. That's that goes way beyond sort of how we reward people at review time. Well, that ties into the whole gratification and compensation question because a lot of people who have ideas, they don't feel they have to run with it personally, but they want to be recognized for it and they want to see their ideas succeed. <clears throat> That's why a couple of companies have become sustaining members of the Institute now. So they can take the ideas, move them over there, not disrupt the current workflow, but make sure the ideas are looked after and nurtured <clears throat> by competent people, and they'll still have a bunch of the upside. Take the disruptive things and do them somewhere else, kind of away from the, the home base. Yes, because with the companies that I've found, because I found the Raptor Systems, the, the first firewall on Authentica, I was the absolute worst nightmare to the organization. I'd walk up and down <clears throat> with the development people. Hey, stop what you're doing. Look at this. This is really cool. Uh, stop for the afternoon. Come help me on this. It became impossible to get a product out the door on time and under budget as long as I was around. So they moved me a couple of hundred miles away and said, you can talk by video phone, but don't darken our doorstep. That turned out to work very well. Uh, one company has now proposed that people who generate ideas can be given short sabbaticals to come spend time at the Institute developing their case so when they come back, it's a much broader, more robust situation and they'll have a better chance of actually getting it funded. And they're trying to create a phantom stock option program. So if it does succeed, the employee who got the idea gets a significant bonus and a piece of the upside, totally irrespective of the normal compensation program. Because the study that they did looked at the probabilities of each step from recognizing the technology of interest to getting all the way to a funded project. And it was about six to seven steps in this company. And each one had about a 90% an 80% chance of succeeding. But if you take 80% to the sixth power, it would something like 1%. 
And they kept wondering, why is our pipeline so empty? Because they've got all these hurdles in the way. This is a way of moving it along, but out of the, the radar vision of management <clears throat> until it's much more likely to be fundable. It's fun, too. Yes, sir. So do you find, when you, when you go talk to companies, you find it easier to talk to companies which are big and huge or small and hopefully more? Small companies understand it and get it <clears throat> a lot more quickly, but usually don't have the resources to move anything outside <clears throat> and tend also to be a lot more paranoid <clears throat> about, well, do we have something here that could turn out to be really profitable for competition? So if I had my druthers, I'd prefer to work with the big companies because they've got so much more that's sitting on the shelf that they don't mind if it goes outside if they've got some upside to it. They're not afraid they're giving away the family jewels. Yes, sir. So do you face a situation where you have several different ideas and you don't, because prime of face, you don't know which one is a good one. So which is the one you select to spend time on? So you can't do all of them together. Well, the, our motto of the Institute is the good news is we can do anything we want. The bad news is we can do anything we want. <clears throat> you put your finger on a very, very serious problem. That's why we get the supporting companies involved <clears throat> to talk about what general market areas they're interested in. And then we factor what we consider to be significant emerging markets. <clears throat> For example, the automotive industry, they don't have the money to go do a lot of things, but they're getting hit with more and more demands for better fuel efficiency, recycling. The European laws for recycling of all the materials going to a car have gotten a whole lot tougher than they have in the US. And we also have a dartboard. I wish I had some good answer for you of how we know. <clears throat> we don't. My question was more about uh, being an individual contributor rather than an organization which needs to do the selection. Like if I have 10 different ideas and I want to choose one of them to spend my weekends on which one do I choose? How do I choose that? You have to trust your gut. <clears throat> what we're working on with one of the companies now is developing a suggestion box website. Because what this company found is people have all these great ideas. Who do you tell? How do you make sure they even get looked at? <clears throat> now, American Airlines came up with an interesting system. You get to submit an idea. And if you don't get a response from the company within, I think it's 60 days, it's automatically funded. <clears throat> that causes people to move along quite quickly. They had a, a stunning little triumph, uh, I guess about two or three years ago. In the first class cabin of all their flights, they'd always have a 200 gram tin of caviar. This was before caviar became illegal. And it was never finished. And the crew would take caviar home, they'd give it to their neighbors, and pretty soon everybody was just totally sick of caviar. But they'd established a tradition of always having it on the plane. One of the cabin tins got the great idea of, instead of one 200-gram tin, put two 100-gram tins in. And so that if you don't need to open the second one, you don't. They saved $575,000 the first year just implementing that. So the, the best thing I can suggest is go chew off the air of your, your manager. Get them involved in listening to what you've got to say. They may like something and say, fine, I like that enough. Go run with it for a while. I'll run cover for you for two weeks while you flesh it out further. And if that doesn't work, just trust your gut. Uh, take, for example, some of the new high-tech composites that were developed by Boeing for the aerospace industry never made a dime, but it totally revolutionized the bowling industry. All the bowling balls you buy these days are these new high-tech materials. The average score of professional bowlers has gone up by something like eight pins as a result of the new materials of the ball. Who would have thought? There's no crystal ball that works. If you find it, please let me know. I'd like to use it. happy to answer any other question. Philip knows how to get a hold of me if you want to say nasty things. Please copy me on the messages because I'm always looking for, for good feedback of the things that I've overlooked or assumptions I've made that may not be relevant to Microsoft. We all learn by hearing them. Thank you.